Well, would you stand, please? Anybody excited? I knew I was in the right church. Hey, uh, you know, last week we just started talking about are you shaken and not stirred, right? Some of you are going back to your James Bond days right now, but are you shaken and not stirred? Or are you stirred and not shaken? And we live in a world today and we live in a culture today that's sort of shaken. Have you noticed that? Just turn on the news. Anybody shaking? There's a lot, there's a whole lot of shaking going on. I mean, there's, there's a whole lot of shaking going on. And God wants his children to be stirred, right? Not shaken. Stirred, say stirred. stirred. Not shaken. Let me pray over you. Father, we come into your presence today because we know that you are good. We come boldly before your throne of grace knowing you are good. And Father, we praise you and we thank you that you are guiding us and you are leading us and you are directing us. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, you dwell within us. We don't have to pray for you to dwell in us. We don't have to ask for you to go with us. You always go with us. You are always leading us. You're always guiding us. Help us to be attentive, Holy Spirit, to your voice. Train us, teach us, help us to become aware, always aware of your guidance and your presence. Lord, we need you. We need you more than ever before. We need to understand your voice with clarity, to hear your voice with clarity, to be led by your spirit, not just to hear, but to completely obey what we hear you say to us. And we thank you that you are doing that. We are obeying you and we are loving you. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. You may be seated. I don't know, you guys are pretty quiet this morning. It's a good crowd, but you're quiet. Last week, we introduced a brand new series entitled Stirred, Not Shaken. Let's say it again. Stirred, Not Shaken. And if you were unable to watch us online or you're able, unable to be here with us in service, I just want to give you a quick overview, just sort of catch you all up, you know, and you'll have to go back and get a lot of it because I can't go through all of it. But let me just give you a quick overview. In, in, second, in the second letter to Timothy, the Apostle Paul writes this second letter to his spiritual son, Timothy, and he's encouraging Timothy to do something. Now, this, that's a key point. He's not just writing because he wants to give Timothy something good to read, right? He's writing Timothy something because he wants him to read it and then obey it and do it. <laughs> you guys are with me. You're like, you guys are so zoned in. All right. So, so he wants him to do it. He's not just writing for him to read it, but he's wanting him to do it. He's not just writing him to read it. He's writing him to do what? To do it. To do it. And then he wants him to do something that will help him to stand strong. To stand strong. To face his fears and successfully fight and win his spiritual battles. We all need that, right? We all need that. Let me read what he said to you. Let me read it again. It's 2 Timothy 1, 5-7. He writes to his spiritual son, I remember your genuine faith. For you share the faith that first filled your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice. And I know that same faith, listen to what he says, I know that same faith continues strong. It, Timothy, I, when, I, when I was with you last time, I remember it continues strong in you, Timothy. Everything I hear about you while I'm sitting here in prison writing this letter, I hear the things that are going on. Timothy, I remember my spiritual son, that faith continues strong in you. This is why I remind you to stir up or to fan into flames the spiritual gift God gave you when I laid my hands on you. For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power, love, and self-discipline. This phrase we talked about last week, stirred up, we were talking more, laying a biblical foundation last week of what it is to be stirred up and then what it is to be shaken. So what it is to be stirred up and what it is to be shaken. That was when we laid a lot of biblical groundwork. This week, I'm going to delve into the real practical application of how do we stir ourselves up. And this, this phrase, to stir up, actually means to stir up a smoldering ember, right? These smoldering embers into a living flame. And if you've ever built a campfire and, you, and you've let it go down and you didn't throw any more fire in it, you wake up in the morning, it's sort of cold and it's dewy outside and you're like, oh gosh, stoke up the fire, right? And, and you'll stir it up and you'll see some little hot embers in there and then you get a little fuel and you start putting it on there and it'll, it'll ignite. And then you throw more fuel on and then you stand real close because you're shaking so much, right? Because you, you, you have to stir it up again. You have to stir it up again. It's like Paul is coaching Timothy 
and what he needs to do when spiritual fires lessen in his life. You know, have you, you know, I, I noticed even, I didn't plan it this way, but in the Rooted video, they were talking about, she was talking about, Tracy was, that she'd gotten to a place where she, she knew that she needed to get back into that place where she could be rooted, right? She needed to remind herself of some things, herself of some things. And she got into the word, she said it changed her. She got around other Christ followers, it changed her. What was she doing? She was rekindling the flame. She was getting back into what was going to cause her to be ignited again. And, and we just get busy. All of us get busy in our lives. Even in, can I tell you, I'm a pastor. I can get real busy and not even talk to God. But my whole job is talking to God and talking to people about God. But I can get so busy. Can I get, can I get a witness? Yeah. Come on. Right. So that's, that's when he tells him, he tells Timothy, listen, Timothy, I know that you're doing battle. I know that you're serving these people. I know that you're a pastor and there's this gift inside of you. But I, Timothy, I want to remind you to stoke up the fire, stir up the gift of God that is in you. Now, I don't have this in my notes today, but I want to give you a little side note. I believe that when the Holy Spirit comes in us, the, the Holy Spirit, when he lives and dwells in us, when you receive Jesus Christ, he comes into your life and the gift, that is the gift of the Holy Spirit. With that gift comes everything that you'll ever need, right? All the gifts, all the stuff, man. It's just like, boom, he comes in. It's like, it's like, it's like a guy walking into Lowe's or Home Depot. It's all you need. You know, it's like you, you walk in and just you walk out with stuff you don't even think you need, right? I mean, all the gifts are in there, whatever your need is. Right, And so you walk into that place. When you walk in or the Holy Spirit walks into you and you walk into him, everything that you need to operate it in. And as the Spirit wills, whenever you need a specific gift, and you will operate in that gift. Right? You can operate in that gift. But there are specific gifts that he'll give you to operate in. Paul had laid hands on his spiritual son, Timothy, and he didn't cause this gift. It was the Holy Spirit that caused this gift. This gift was already in him, but when he re laid his hands upon him, it caused Timothy to become aware and to recognize the spiritual gift that was in him. I think the spiritual gift he's talking about is the gift of teaching. The gift of pastoring. And he's saying, Timothy, I want, you to, I want you to stir up your communication gift, son. I want you to get passionate again. I want you to preach the word of God. I want you to be like an evangelist. I want you to get out there and tell the truth about who Jesus is. Remind him. Timothy, stir up that gift. And when you stir up that gift, you know, before I come out here sometimes, I'm back here pacing. Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I thank you for the gift and the anointing on my life. In the name of Jesus, I pray that you catch me on fire and it catches everybody on fire. You don't know that I'm doing that, but that's what I'm doing. I'm back there pacing. There's a little place in the carpet that's wearing out. <laughs> what am I doing? I'm stirring myself up. I'm stirring myself up in my gift. It's my gift. You have a gift. Some of you need to stir up your gift. It's just laying there. You're not using it. You need to stir it up. Some of you ought to get back there with the kids because you got the kid gift. Please, in Jesus' name. <laughs> Raise those little ones up to fight and find and follow Jesus Christ. And rapture. some of you need to get in students. Some of you need to be in music. Some of you need to run sound. Some of you need to be smiling out there and actually be nice to people. You can do it. It's your gift. <laughs> and it goes a long way, doesn't it? When we walk in, it's better to see this than that's. If you are a frowner, you, that is not your gift. <laughs> Or you need to work on it, okay? And we're going to help you work on it. Smile, chew some gum. Not all the time, but your breath. You know, I'm just telling you, right? You got to, you know, you gotta, you're always working on that gift. When God gives you a gift, it means you have to develop it. You got to continue to develop that gift. This is just like Shazam, and it's like you're perfect in it. I will work the rest of my life on communication, it's my gift, but I'm always honing it, always working on it. When I pray for people, I don't think, I don't pray like I used to pray when I first started praying. You would not want me to pray for you if I prayed like I used to pray. But I'm glad that people let me pray for them because I had to learn how to pray. I had to learn how to stand in faith, not to be distracted. This is not in my notes, but I'm so excited. <laughs> right? Stir up the gift that is in you. What is that gift? You don't know? Go to Growth Track and we do a spiritual gift test and you'll find out. They came yesterday, some people found out, and then they're, now they're stirring themselves up in that. Right? And we have it since it's, it's a little form. We know what your gift is and we put it in your file and we call you up now and we say, are you stoking it? <laughs> 
just sort of messing with you. All right, so that's where we ended last week. And we said that Timothy was going to stir up. And how I ended last week, I ended with this statement. I said that I'm going to give everybody three things this weekend, three things that would help you catch on fire and stay on fire. Catch on fire and stay on fire. We need, we need to know what, how, do, how do we catch on fire when the, when the fire's waning, when the coals are getting, whoo, it's not good, the flames are dissipating. What do I, what I need to do? I need to be aware how I stoke up that fire, how I stir up the gift of God that is in me. So these three actions are these three steps that I'm going to give you today. It's very, very practical day, all right? So I'm going to give you the three steps that you need to stand in faith, to walk in faith, to stay on fire. That's what we're going to be talking about. So first, let me state them to you, okay? And I, I, I made this little, this, this little it's, a, it's, just, it's a really cool little thing. It's, a, it's called tools, right? And so here you've got a magnifying glass. Stay focused. Here you've got a fuel pump. So you've got focus, fill. Ah. Fill. Fight. Focus, fill, fight. Let's say it. Focus, fill, fight. Now, Timothy, just like Timothy, every Christ follower, please listen to me if you're new to Christ or just sort of checking Christ out or, you know, you've been coming for a while. Maybe you're returning. You're returning. You've been away for a while. Now you're returning. And I want to just, I want to be full disclosure here. Every Christ follower, you're watching us online, every Christ follower faces things that try to entice them to second guess God. We face things every single day that try to get you to second guess your faith in God. You, to second guess his presence. Is he really with me or is he not with me? He says the Holy Spirit's in me and the Bible says this, I don't feel him, I don't sense him. Where are you, Holy Spirit? Listen, I want to talk to you in that level because that's where people live, but nobody ever talks about it out loud because we get so scared. Like, well, if we say that, then we don't really believe in Jesus. Yes, you do, but everything's trying to entice you away from his presence. His power, is it really operating in your life? His pr protection in your life. And when we begin to second guess God or when we begin to doubt his presence in our life or his power in his life, our life or his provision in our life, it's because, and this is what I believe, it's because we have neglected putting fuel on the fire. We've neglected doing the things that keep us Close to him. Do you know there are things that you can do that will keep you close to the presence of God? And there are things that you can do and think that will keep you away from the presence of God? Have you ever been in worship and your mind goes, Doom. It's like, wow, it's so wild, isn't it? How that happens. And you have to fight to focus, right? So the first thing that if you're going to rekindle the fire, if you're going to stir yourself up and stir up that gift that's within you, you must learn to focus. Say focus. Focus, focus actually means to center your attention or activity. To center your attention. To focus, to center your attention or your activity. And when we lose our focus, we lose our attention. Have you noticed that? If you lose your focus on something, you'll lose attention toward that thing you were focusing on, and now your attention is looking for something else to put it to. It just, it's the way it works. When we lose our focus, we lose our attention. As you know, I love the Zags and, and probably all thing college basketball, right? I just, I love it. I was watching it yesterday. I don't care who was playing. I was thinking Duke was going to win, but they lost. And so, so I'm watching that and, and it's like, I don't have a dog in the hunt, but I just like to watch college basketball. And I always enjoy when the student section, man, I love, I, I'm so glad that we're through this COVID stuff because the student sections not being there is a bad deal, right? And so the student sections, they, they get all riled up, don't they? They get, they get excited about things and they start jumping around and they start, and, and I, have you ever watched them when somebody's, your, your opponent is shooting a free throw and they try to distract them, don't they? Yeah. They go crazy. I mean, some colleges go to elaborate things. Like one college has curtains and they shut the curtain and while the guy's getting ready, he's dribbling and then they open up a curtain and then this guy comes out with some kind of suit on and, they, and everybody goes, Wah! you know, and they're trying to, what are they trying to do? Distract him from hitting his goal. Distract him to make him lose focus. And why do they do that? Because they really believe that they could potentially change the outcome of the game if they can cause that individual to lose focus. 
That's exactly what the enemy does with us. He believes he can change the game. He can change your wherewithal. He can change your victory. He can change your walk with God. If he can just distract you long enough. If he can just distract you. Our, our opponent is always trying to get us to lose our focus. He's always trying to distract us with something in order to move our attention away from God. This is what it looks like. Squirrel. <laughs> I couldn't help it. I heard somebody say it earlier, but I got to do it anyway. Squirrel. It's so true, isn't it? You're talking, you're talking to God and Father, I just come to you right now. Squirrel. <laughs> I hear you, squirrel. <laughs> Father, I'm just praying this morning. Lord, I come to you on behalf of squirrel. It's happening to us all the time. Psalm 119.35 says, turn my eyes from squirrel. <laughs> Turn my eyes from, let's all say it, squirrel. squirrel. <laughs> Turn my eyes from worthless things and give me what? Life through your, what is that word? Word. Give me life through your, God, help me turn my eyes from worthless things. What he's saying is, help me to focus on things that are worth everything. And everything that is worth anything is in your word. God, help me think on your word. So lack of focus, first and foremost, will take your eyes off of God, won't it? Squirrel. It'll squirrel you out. <laughs> Whatever loses your focus will lose your attention. That's why the fire goes out. You know, I hear, Teresa and I have been in this for a while now, and, and we hear a lot of people say things like, well, I'm just not in love with them anymore. <laughs> no, that's not the problem. No, that's not the problem. The problem is you couldn't keep stoking the fire of that love you had. You didn't keep stirring the embers in that romance. The fire hasn't burned out. You neglected it. And all the married couples said, amen. or oh me. Okay, <laughs> amen or oh me. They both work the same way. Now, when we lose attention, we lose our focus. I will cause you to change. It will also cause you to change your direction. So if you notice that when you lose your, your focus, you lose your attention. But also when whatever you focus on, it will change your direction. Whatever you focus on, this is exactly why uh, all the uh, driver's education trainers always say, keep your eyes on the road. Why do they say keep your eyes on the road? Because they want you to keep your eyes on the road because whatever you focus on, you're veer toward. Whatever you focus on, you'll veer toward. Some of us are going to be veering away from God because what we're focused on is not godly. So we'll begin to focus away from God. True? When I grew up in the South, my, my, uh, my aunt, aunt and uncle, they lived in this, this flat area where these big dredges came through and opened up these creek beds and then the water all drained in because it was swamp and then they made it farmland, beautiful, beautiful farmland. The problem is where they did those dredges, when you walk along that bank, it was really muddy and really slippery. <laughs> and if you play around the bank long enough, you'll slip in. Whatever you focus on, whatever you hang around, what are you walk around, it could cause you to slip right in. <laughs> what you focus on, you veer toward. And if you focus on the things that frustrate you about your spouse, anybody ever tried to do that? Woo, the only thing you'll see in your spouse is that thing that you focused on and won't be long until you're not married to them. Why? Because they're an idiot. Well, you married that person. It was just, I never saw that before. No, it's because you kept focusing on it and you didn't learn to renew your mind and start thinking on other things and feed and fuel that flame that you needed to feed and fuel because you could only see the one stupid thing they were doing. I don't know why I'm preaching on marriage this morning, but this is for somebody. <laughs> When we lose our focus, number one, we become distracted from God and the things of God. When you, when you lose your focus. Number two, it changes our direction. And finally, number three, whatever you veer toward, have you noticed this, will become bigger. Now, for my first little illustration. This is a magnifying glass, right? And when you use a magnifying glass, you don't actually make the thing that you're looking at bigger, you just magnify it, 
right? Have you ever noticed that the more you focus on the problem, the bigger it becomes? Have you ever noticed that? There's a problem, I know. <laughs> and man, we focus on it. This thing even has lights. I mean, like, uh, <laughs> I can zone in. Focus can work for you, can't it? And it can work against you. Now, Psalm, in Psalm 33, uh, 34, 3, it says this, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let's say it. Oh, magnify the Lord with me, and let us exalt his name together, the scripture says. Magnify, magnify the Lord with me. When we magnify something, listen, it causes you to do what? It causes you to see whatever you're magnifying clearer. When you magnify it, you begin to see whatever you're magnifying, you begin to see it more clearly. Isn't that true? The object seems to get bigger when you magnify it. It's like, oh, it's getting bigger. It's not, and then you go, oh, no, it's not. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, no, it's not. Oh, yes, it is. <laughs> Isn't that true? And it looks like the object is getting bigger, but if the object didn't get bigger, your view of it did. Please catch that. The more we focus on God, the bigger he becomes in our lives. Magnify the Lord. Have you ever been in a huge challenge in your life? And, and worship is a taproot for me. And I'm, and I'm faced with some struggles, and I'm faced with some challenges, or someone I know is going through a difficulty, and I'm just so focused on what they're going through or what they're dealing with that it's, it's captured my attention, it's captured my focus, and I've made it big. I can't see anything else. It's just the biggest thing in my life. And I'll put on some worship music. I hear you call. I am available. What do I do immediately by doing that? I magnify the Lord instead of magnify my problem or my fear or my frustration. I magnify the Lord. If you've ever lost your flame, you have more than likely lost your focus. You've just lost your focus. So the first thing that will rekindle your fire, is, and, and let's go back to the Rooted video, all she did, all Tracy did was she made a decision to go to Rooted. She changed her focus. That's all she did. Change your focus. Whatever you focus on, you'll veer toward. Isn't that true? Yeah. And it changes everything in you. So the first thing to, to get this fire rekindled is to focus. Second is to fill. Oh, fill. Right here. Gas pump. And filling up can be expensive. <laughs> Have you noticed? <laughs> and I want to say it this way. Fill up your mind. Say fill up your mind. Fill now there's no hose because I couldn't bring it out here to you if I did that. See, I, the hose wasn't long enough, so just take that hose off. You know? Now, sometimes we have to just fill up our mind, right? Fill up our mind. Romans 12, 2 says this. Don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by what? Changing the way you think. Changing the way you think. How do you... How do you change the way you think? You have to fill your mind with something other than you've been thinking on. You've got to fill it up. And not only do you fill up your mind, you fill up your heart. Fill your heart with good things. Think on these things, the Bible tells us. Things of a good report, things that are above, not beneath. To, to fill yourself up, to think on the... It's very difficult, isn't it? When you want to think about something negatively, to think about something positively. I don't want to think about something positive right now. I'm ticked off. Fill yourself up. No! And that's exactly what happens, doesn't it? I'm filling myself up with anger right now. God! And we fill ourselves up with anger, and then we've... we've guess what? We, we burn with anger, don't we? Yeah. Whatever you fill yourself with, you'll burn with. Whatever you fill yourself with, you'll burn. So not only do I want to fill my mind, fill my heart, I want to fill my life. Right? It's ooh, all around me, hallelujah. Here's a little for everybody. <laughs> Isn't that true? Isn't that what we need to do? We need to focus and we need to fill. We need to fill our lives with God's word. Now, a lot of people say, well, you feel God. Okay, how do I, how do, I do my, feel God, fill my life with God's word. What I'm, what I'm talking about is, 
Fill your time, fill your day with God's word. You all, if you have a cell phone, did you know that you can set a little timer to go off every hour, every two hours, every three hours, and it just goes beep, 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 beep. I go, what's that stupid alarm going off for? And you pick it up and it says, read God's word. Oh, yeah. Just flip to your Bible or open it up on your screen and just read one scripture, put it back away, and then go back to work. You say, well, that, that won't change anything. That will change everything. You know a little magnifying glass? Just so tiny, isn't it? How can a tiny thing, focus, make something so big? How can filling my time change how I burn? You're gonna read a scripture at your office and that one person that you really don't like at work is gonna come in right afterwards. <laughs> and instead of lighting him up, you're gonna be lit up. You're going to say, I'm not going to respond to that. I'm going to love you because I just read a scripture. My beeper just went off and you should be praising God right now because <laughs> I would like to dress you down instead of dress you up. <laughs> but I'm not going to do that because I have just been filled with God's <laughs> spirit. If I'm going to burn with a godly fire, I'm going to have to be filled with a godly fuel. Isn't that true? Some of you, have you ever, don't raise your hand because this is embarrassing. Have you ever put diesel into a regular gas engine? It doesn't work really well. Now it's gas. Looks like it would work. Seems like it would work. But the viscosity, the oil that's in diesel working in a regular gas engine clogs up the fuel pump. And then if that's not enough, it clogs up the fuel filter. And if that's not enough, it shuts down your motor and you can't go anywhere now because you filled your tank with the wrong stuff. And we fill our tank with the wrong stuff all the time. Thank you. <laughs> Isn't it true? How about this? Let's, let's change the, let's go from fuel to burning. Like, I've got a Traeger. Any guy, anybody got a Traeger in here? You got a smoker? It's like, mm, I like that Traeger. Come on. And we used it yesterday, did some steak. Mm, 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 mm. All right? And so we got the Traeger. And I got, it's got pellets, you know? A Traeger, I don't know if you know this, but it was designed to burn pellets. So if you put charcoal and some lighter fuel in the place where the pellets go, it's going to burn. It's not going to be good, though, for your house and everything surrounding. It's going to burn everything down, right? And it's going to it's, talk about a unique taste for your food. It's going to be very unique. How about this? Well, forget that. How about some grass clippings? Let's just do that. Throw some grass clippings in there. Turn it on for smoke. See what happens. Oh, it's going to smoke. And it's going to clog up everything. Why, why are you saying that, Pastor? Well, whatever we fill ourselves with is what we burn with. And you and I were not created by God to be filled with fear or to be filled with doubt or to be filled with anger or to be filled with judgment and criticism. We fill ourselves with that. And guess what we do? We burn with criticism. We burn with anger. We burn with fear. And God says, I, I didn't create you to burn with that. I created you to burn with my word in prayer, in fellowship, and in worship. I, I want you to burn in those places. Our spiritual life doesn't burn with fear and negativity. It burns with God's word and his presence. That's what we're to burn with. To burn with the Holy Spirit. That's what we're to burn with. But if you're going to burn with the Holy Spirit, you've got to be being filled with the Holy Spirit all the time. Be being filled. Be being filled. Be being filled. So focus, fill. Focus, fill. You say, so how do I fill myself? Anybody, like, have you ever heard of audiobooks? Yeah. Just buy some godly books. Not the shaman stuff, okay? But godly, shaman, what is this guy's name? Uh, shaman, what's the guy's name? Yeah. Writes all the scary. Yeah, Shalom, something, I, yeah, uh, whatever it is, okay. So, it's not in my notes, as you can tell. So, don't, don't read those things. Read the things that are going to, what, fuel you up to burn with godly stuff. Make your car a college. Yes. 
Make your car a college, man. Just drive around, just download God's stuff all day long. Just fill yourself up with devotionals, audio books, godly podcasts. And serving others can, can do that. We have a tendency just to fill our tanks up with anything. Don't do that. Fill it up with godly fuel. So number one, fix your focus. Okay, this is focus. Say focus. focus. Fill. Now we're going to move to the third one. Fight. Fight. In Ephesians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul reveals that every believer is in a fight. This is what happens when you receive your, some people raise their hand at the end of the service and they receive Jesus. And then when they put it back down on Monday morning, they discover something that they didn't discover before. My gosh, I'm in a fight. Where are all these thoughts coming from? I never noticed that before. Seems like all hell's breaking loose in my life. I know you just never noticed hell before because you were in hell. Right? You were walking around in this environment, in this kingdom that there was no godly presence around, and now you've taken God everywhere you're used to going, and then all of a sudden you, you are sensing God's presence and sensing him like you never had before. It was like a war. There's a war going on. You're in a battle. Paul tells us that we're in a fight. But not only that, he tells us that we have, in Ephesians 6, we are in a fight, but we have been given every weapon we need to win that fight. That's good news. Ephesians 6, 10 through 12 says this, a final word. Be strong in the Lord. Notice it's in the Lord, not in yourself. Be strong in the Lord and in his, not yours, his mighty power. Put on all of, did you notice it's not your armor? It's God's armor. Put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all, not some, of the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting, there's that word, we're in a fight against flesh and blood in enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. This is why sometimes you feel pressure. This is why sometimes you feel uneasy. You don't know why you feel uneasy. You don't know why you're sensing what you're sensing. It's not an emotional thing that you're going through. It's not a physical thing you're going through. It's a spiritual understanding that you are in a battle and God wants you to fight. Fight. We are to fight the battle. So he said, we're in this fight. And then he says, I've given you, though, everything that you need. The belt of truth. The breastplate of righteousness. The shoes of peace. The shield of faith. And then he says, what? He says, put on salvation as your helmet. And then he says, take up the sword of the spirit. Now notice what he says, which is the word of God. Take up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. You know what's cool about this right now is I have every man's attention in here. <laughs> Men love swords and guns, man. Just walk out on the stage with that. You got me, Pastor. Amen. I'm with you. So Paul tells us that we have the sword, say sword, sword. of the Spirit. And it's the word of of God, right? The sword of the spirit is the word of God. Now, this, this, this word that he says is the word of God, the sword of the spirit is the word, say the word. The word is rhema, it's the Greek word rhema. It means, now listen, this is so important because this is the biggest thing I want to end with today and I want you to remember it. It, rem it means something that is spoken clearly. Something that is spoken clearly. Clearly, Rhema means the sword. You use this sword. The sword is in your hand when you have heard something spoken to you clearly. And if you don't have a word, you don't have a sword. Now what I mean is we have the written word. But just having the word in your brain is like taking this sword and put it back in the sheath and just let it lay there. You're going to have to use this sword. You're going to have to wield this sword. Something that is spoken clearly, it describes a fresh word or an immediate word from God. This fresh word from God becomes a mighty sword in our hands in the spirit realm. The writer of Hebrews 
he, he says something uh, in Hebrews 4.12. Let me read it to you. He says, for the word of God is alive and powerful. Notice what he says. The word of God, this is the sword, is the word of God, right? The word of God is alive and powerful. It's sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. Sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword. This word of God is like a two-edged sword in your hand. Now, two-edged swords, there were Roman soldiers used one-edged swords, and they had two-edged swords. Two-edged swords, you know, when they would try to come down to somebody's legs or try to come at their body or come at their head, if they had a helmet on, they could still be protected. But the one thing that would always get a, another person, an enemy, is this movement. Because when you go into their abdomen, it cuts on both sides, and it is a death blow in military. That's why we have been given a two-edged sword. It is the Greek word dystomos. Dystomos. According to one Bible scholar, this word dystomos is one of the oddest words in the Bible. Why? Because it's a compound word of, of D, which means two, right? Two-sided, D, two-sided. And then it is, the other word is stomos, which is the Greek word, are you ready? Mouth. Mouth. Are you kidding me? Two mouthed? You've given us something that's two mouthed? But by uniting these two things together, it means to be two mouthed. This is what it says in Revelations. The, John on the Isle of Patmos. John. The disciple of Jesus on the Isle of Patmos, Revelations 1.16, listen to what he says. He has this vision of Jesus, this vision of Jesus of, in his exalted form, and he says this. He held seven stars in his right hand, and a, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his where? Mouth. Came from his mouth. And his face was like the sun in all of its brilliance. Here's what I really believe. We need to understand that it's not enough to fill our mind with God's word. We have to speak God's word to fight with it. Jesus said, it is written. Yep, yep. And then what did he do? He didn't say, it's written, and there you go, look at it, devil. He spoke what has, had been written. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Yeah. The devil went, well, let me, try, let, me, let me try another tactic here. And Jesus was like, bring it on. I said, bring it on. <laughs> Why, he's not nervous. This is not in his hand, it was in his mouth. Yeah. He heard the word of God and then spoke the word of God. He heard the word of God, he got a word from God, and then he spoke the word of God. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. But be ye doers of the word, <laughs> speakers of the word, not hearers only. Have you ever been in a fight when you're in the middle of a fight and you're praying? And all of a sudden, this scripture maybe that you've read a hundred times before pops into your brain. It's like you're just praying and praying. And there's there's this, this scripture. That's an immediate rhema word from God to remind you of something in his word. And you know what he wants you to do? He doesn't want you to do this. Oh, that's pretty cool. I remember that verse. That is not what he's saying. He is saying, say it. I will live and not die and I will declare the works of the Lord. Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. I renew my mind to the word of God. I am filled with the spirit of God. I will live and not die. I will be strong and courageous. You see what I'm saying? And it's different when you're in prayer and you're not really sure what to pray about and you're in prayer and then something, boom, it comes. And then you, you say, oh, that's a sword. That's a, that's a sword to be actively aggressive in my military advance with my enemy. And this is what God wants us to know. I'm so glad that you can read the word. I'm so glad that you can even remember the word, but that's not what you need to be doing with it. You need to be speaking the word. Well, 
What do you mean? Isn't this exactly what Paul did with Timothy? Timothy, I remind you, stir up. What was Timothy's word from the Apostle Paul? Stir up. Rekindle. You're in a battle. All hell's breaking loose in your life. You're being attacked on every side. Timothy, stir up. And Timothy, guess what he did? He went. (laughs) This is awesome. Luke. No, it's not. I'm sorry. Matthew, Mark, Luke, no. <laughs> I've been in prayer, you know, as many of you know that several years ago, about over almost six years now, I was diagnosed with four stage cancer. Never saw that coming, never anticipated that coming. And immediately Teresa and I went back into battle. We understand how to fight, we know how to fight. But when you fight something like that, it takes you right back into, it takes you right back into your training, doesn't it? And what you had not been using, now you pick it up again and you start like, you know, (laughs) sharpening the sword and shining it up and, okay, I haven't been living like this. I I gotta go to another level of living. And and we rekindled something in us. We rekindled something in us. And during that time, the Lord gave me several words and Teresa several words too. So many things that we held on to. Please listen to me. This is powerful. This is what stirs up your gift. This is what keeps you strong. Psalm 107, 20 through 21. I remember saying this over and over, over myself. You spoke the word that healed me, that pulled me back from the brink of death. So I thank you, Father, for your marvelous love, for your miracle mercy that consumes my life through your love. I, it's the first part. You spoke the word that healed me, not will heal me, that healed me, that pulled me back from the brink of death. The doctor said, death is next, but you said, no, not for my son. You say, well, it seems like it's really powerful to you. When you wield that word, it becomes a powerful weapon in your hand. Another word that God gave me, that's the written word, but he spoke this to me. I remember we were getting ready to go to a a big, one of those big doctor's appointments. You know what I'm talking about? Because today you find out some stuff. And you get a little nervous and you're walking in, get ready to walk in and we're praying and right before I, I go in, Teresa and I are in our living room, we're walking around praying. And the Holy Spirit said to me so strongly, I'm just, I'm just praying. I, and I heard him say, today is a day of victory, all is well, I've got this. Today, he said it again, today is a day of victory. All is well. My son, I've got this. Can I tell you what I did? I went, yes, Lord. And you know what he said? Say it. Say it. Today is a day of victory. All is well. You've got this, Father. Today is a day of victory. All is well. You told me all is well. You've got this, Father. Do you see how that rekindles your faith? We've been too sheepish. We've been too lackadaisical. You have been given the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and you are to declare the word of God over your life. You are not to play games. You are not just messing around. You've been given the tools to defeat your enemy. You cannot keep that weapon sheathed. You must pull it out and do battle. You've got to speak the word over your situation. You say, I don't know the word. Find the word. Pray, God, show me your word. And then you go to battle with that word. If you're going to rekindle this fire, you're going to have to do what? Let's say it. You're going to have to focus. You're going to have to, and you will have to. Let's stand. Father, I come to you today and I praise you and I thank you that you are helping us to rekindle the fire that is in us. We've been given the Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit, for those of us who have received you, we have been filled with the Holy Spirit. You lead us and you guide us into all all faith. You lead us and guide us into all truth. You lead us and guide us in all battles to win, not to lose. You lead us and guide us. You tell us where to swing the sword. You tell us what to focus on. You tell us what to fill ourselves up with. Holy Spirit, we thank you and praise you for your presence in our life. Holy Spirit, we need you. Holy Spirit, awaken 
awaken us to your presence. Holy Spirit, guide us. Awaken us in, in, in the night and reveal things to us. Reveal things to us when we're working. Reveal things to us when we're praying. Reveal things to us when we're cooking. Reveal things to us when we're driving around. Holy Spirit, reveal your word to us. And we thank you, God, that you are doing that right now, right now in this place. Now with every head bowed, every eye closed, you're watching us online, you're here in this service, and you say, Pastor Will, I just wanna, I wanna be rekindled, I wanna be, I wanna burn again with the fire of God. Then what you've got to do is focus. Get your focus back on God. Do what you have to do this week to focus on Him. Read the Word, start praying, set a timer on your phone. Be intentional to focus. Second, start filling yourself up with good things to listen to. Surround yourself with worship, me, uh, worship music. The Bible says I surround myself with songs of deliverance. Not of defeat, but of deliverance. Surround yourself with those kinds of songs. Fill yourself up by reading his word. Fill yourself up by praying. Just, just start, fill, say, Holy Spirit, I don't even know how to fill myself up. He'll show you how to do that. And then you've got to fight. Quit, quit saying the things that don't help you win. Say the things that remind you that you've already won. That you're not trying to win. That you've already won. You've already won. Speak the word of God. Get your word from God. Get in the scripture and get your word. Pray and ask the Holy Spirit to give you your word and then fight with that word. Now still with every head bowed, high close, you say, I've never received Jesus Christ. I don't have the Holy Spirit in me. Well, I've got some great news for you. Because all you have to do is say, Holy Spirit, come into my life. Father, forgive me. I receive your son as my savior. I confess him as my Lord and my Savior, and I don't understand everything it means, but I am tired of trying to be my own Savior and try to be my own King. It doesn't work. I need your Son, Jesus, and I'm ready to receive him right now. If that's you on the count of three watching us online or here in the Valley Campus, would you just raise your hand when I get to three? You say, that's me. I want Jesus. One, two. You say, that's me. Three. I want Jesus in my life. I see your hand. Somebody else, you say, that's me. I see your hand. Thank you so much. You say, that's me. All right. You may slip your hands down. Father, I pray for every person that raised their hand watching us online, watching us here in the service. I pray that you just minister to them all throughout this day, that they would sense your presence, that they would know your presence is real, and that they would be changed from the inside out, and that they would begin to focus and to fill and to fight with what you've given them. Father, I praise you and I thank you for that. In Jesus' name, everybody said, amen. Let's give the Lord a big hand, would you please? Wow, what a powerful message that we just heard. And if you just raised your hand, or maybe you were thinking about raising your hand, we just want to say welcome home. You just made the best decision that you could ever make. And we want to help you in this journey. So make sure that you fill out a digital connect card and tell somebody today that you accepted Jesus for the very first time. We also have a free gift for you called You Matter to God. And it's a free download. You can click the link on the screen and that can happen right now. We can get that book in your hands. Church, we're so glad that you joined us today. If you have prayer of any of, of anything, please make sure that you go to onespokane.com slash prayer, or you can stay in the chat. Our team would love to pray with you. Church, we love you. We hope you have a blessed week. We'll see you next time.